Joining me this Sunday morning, the minister leading Canada's vaccine procurement efforts, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, Anita Anand. Nice to see you, Minister. Nice to see you too, Rosie. I'm going to start with uh, vaccine deliveries. Um, just in terms of some numbers, we are expected, if, if I'm not mistaken, to get 70 doses, 70,000 doses this week of Pfizer-BioNTech. Uh, so not the 360,000 that, that we anticipated. Next week, the forecast calls for 336,000, and after that, it jumps to 400,000. You can correct me if any of those numbers have changed. But m my question is this: Do do we anticipate further delays from Pfizer, or is this are, are we on track now and things? Should move ahead smoothly. Well, thanks for having me on. And I guess what I'd like to start out by saying is that the temporary delays that we have seen are largely behind us. We are receiving solid confirmation from our vaccine suppliers, especially Pfizer, as you mentioned in your question, that we are on track for 4 million doses delivered prior to the end of March and for Moderna 2 million prior to the end of March and then moving into the spring 20 million doses at least of approved suppliers and then all Canadians will have access to a vaccine prior to the end of September we expect more than 70 million uh, vaccines in aggregate to have arrived and that's just of approved vaccines at this point should additional vaccines come online i.e. with Health Canada approval uh, uh, we hope to continue to have additional supplementary deliveries of vaccines into this country. And so we are going to see a continuous ramp up of vaccines mm -hmm. over the next weeks and months. And uh, from February 15th onwards, it's going to be a steep incline and the provinces and territories uh, should be aware that that is going to occur. And we're gonna need to have all hands on deck for the rollout of uh, a large scale vaccine. Okay. Coming in uh, ju just if I can ask a question about Moderna, uh, we were supposed to get about 250,000 doses the week of February 22nd. It, it, uh, when we, when I last heard from Major General Denis Fortin, there wasn't a number. Do you have a number at this stage? I do not, and I just want to stress with you that the numbers regarding week-to-week -week delivery schedules uh, do pass from the supplier directly to the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Major General and his counterparts continue to provide that information as soon as we get it. And Rosie, I want to make sure that your uh, viewers understand that we are one of the only jurisdictions, if not the only jurisdiction, that is providing delivery schedules in real time to the public and to the Okay. provinces and territories in our jurisdiction. Okay. That is very rare across the world, and it's so important to remember from a transparency standpoint, that is a priority for us. Well, uh, let's talk about transparency because there are some areas where you are not as transparent as other places in the world, and that is on the issue of contracts. Uh, I, I understand that you said you would go back to the companies to see if you could release details. I, I don't know why you would need to do that if you're prepared to redact some of the details. Why don't you make those contracts public as much as you can. Well, I want to be clear that my focus and our government's focus is on protecting our vaccine procurements, making sure that these procurements of vaccines come into the country as expeditiously as possible. In these contracts, it is standard around the world to have confidentiality clauses. And we as a government are loath to undermine, indeed violate those uh, confidentiality clauses and put our vaccine procurements at risk. That would be a very dangerous situation from a health and safety standpoint. And we do not want to put the vaccines that we have purchased okay. but, at but, risk. But if the, if the, e, but if the EU and the US have been able to release some details, uh, surely there are parts of the contract that you could release and that might actually reassure Canadians to see that. Exactly. And I understand that point. I want to be clear that what has been released, uh, for example, the AstraZeneca contract in the EU was released as a result of both parties to a contract agreeing that certain clauses of that contract would be released. The contract was heavily redacted and did not contain information such as delivery schedules, which is information that we are providing to the provinces and territories and Canadians at large. I am engaged with our vaccine suppliers 
on this issue, I do believe transparency and accountability are so important. So, so just just so I understand, you you are efforting. It sounds like to to be able to release some details, but but the details won't be useful to the provinces, or or how would you characterize what you might be able to tell us? Well, thanks. Uh, the the details in the contract contain quarterly delivery schedules. Right. And that is information we have already provided. When we receive the weekly delivery schedules, we provide that information as soon as we get that. Mm -hmm. And so the contractual information that is being sought, in my view, would not be useful. We are providing the information in real time as we get it. Right. In addition, we have to remember uh, that contracts contain two parties. And the government of Canada is just one of the parties to the contract. Yeah. We can't unilaterally disclose clauses without an agreement from the other side, which is an agreement and a conversation that I'm involved in okay. right now uh, to ensure that we can seek some type of resolution here. Okay, uh, we, we know that the government's invested more than uh, $1.3 billion in vaccine agreements. Uh, I believe there's an update to that number coming soon. Is, is, is that still the number or has it increased substantially? Do you know, Minister? We provided that number in the fall economic statement. And since that time, there have been updates, uh, which we will work into a revised number to provide to the Canadian public. For example, we purchased options of uh, both Pfizer and Moderna late in 2020. Uh, and in addition, we finalized the APA with Novavax. And so we will come back to you with a revised number. So it, it, it's probably significantly higher than that, given what you've just said there. Exactly. We're going to come back uh, with a revised number. But remember, uh, we are putting all our efforts on the table for the most expeditious delivery of vaccines to Canadians. This is my priority. This is our government's priority. And that's what we are working towards every day in our contracts, in our negotiations and our discussions with suppliers. Uh, I, I, I just want to ask you a question about COVAX. I, I do understand that it is a sort of cooperative uh, agreement wherein we, we invest money to help other countries and have an option to purchase. Uh, and we've, we've used that option. I get all of that. I, I just wonder whether you think, given some of the criticism, it is still um, ethically the, the best thing for Canada to be doing as, as a, a leader in the world um, and as a country that wants to de help developing nations. Are you still comfortable with this decision? The decision to participate in the pooled procurement mechanism known as COVAX uh, was made in 2020. And at that time, we understood that there are two pillars of the COVAX uh, arrangement. One, uh, a pillar for self-financing countries, and two, a pillar for developing countries. And Canada was one of the largest contributors to both of those mm -hmm. facilities, yeah. contributing $220 million. We are committed to donating doses to the developing world once we have a secure supply of vaccines into Canada. And we are playing a leading role in the governance of the institution with our Minister yeah. of International Development. So all of that to say, in answer to your question, we are comfortable that we are still upholding our commitment to multilateralism and to the developing world. What, what would we have to have in terms of supply in order for us to be able to give some away? Because, it, it, you know, I wouldn't say we're swimming in things right now. So at what point would we, we be comfortable uh, saying, OK, we've got enough. Here's some for the rest of the world. Well, it is a great question. And in our procurements, Rosie, I take uh, advice from the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Vaccine Task Force, from the medical experts, mm -hmm. in other words. And so from a procurement standpoint, my job is to ensure that we have this continuous supply of vaccines into Canada. And that's exactly what we're doing. These deliveries are continuing to ramp up. We are going to see a preponderance of vaccines coming into this country over the spring and summer, beginning um, as we speak 
Indeed, we were one of the first countries to begin inoculations and one of the first countries to sign with these vaccine manufacturers. Sure. And once we have a stable supply of vaccines in this country, I believe the Public Health Agency of Canada and uh, the Vaccine Task Force will be better placed to provide us with advice relating to uh, the donations that we will make to other countries. And indeed, that's a commitment that not just I am making. Uh, Rosie, our Prime Minister, has said on numerous occasions that unless everyone is safe, no one is safe. And that is our commitment to sharing with the rest of the world. Okay, Minister, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Rosie. Take care.